This episode of Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point is sponsored by Lucid, an evening of short plays produced by brand new Grand Rapids, Michigan theater company, Curious Arrow. This unique series of short original works by playwrights from around the country centers on the theme of dreams and dreaming. Each piece is directed and will be performed by luminary local talent at Dog Story Theater, located at 7 Jefferson, downtown Grand Rapids, this weekend, September 15 and 16 at 8 p.m. and September 17 at 3 p.m. Tickets are $14, $12 for students and seniors, and are available for purchase at www.eventbrite.com. That's www.eventbrite.com or at the door. Come join Curious Arrow for its first production in Dog Story's intimate performance art space deep within the heart of one of the Midwest's artistic hubs and let the lucid dreams you see on stage carry you away. Stay curious. Hello, and welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point. This is a podcast based on a blog of the same name because that would be our name whether we've been replaced by a lifelike Android version of ourselves or not, okay? My name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and or checking out the blog at couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com as you're about to find some common ground or something you like. For Couch Potatoes Unite, we're all about the wonders and the unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU wishes you rest from the heat and hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays, and as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panelists and I live lives behind our podcast, the episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to the blog or the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and via Google Play to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler, including but not limited to Game of Thrones, Stranger Things, Grimm, American Horror Story, How to Get Away with Murder, Gotham, Once Upon a Time, Supernatural, and the Marvel's Netflix series, including Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist. Plus, new episodes are in the works, including revisits for New Girl, The 100, Doctor Who, Orange is the New Black, The Originals, and the DCTU series panel covering Arrow, Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, and Supergirl with an episode for each show. A final visit with our Broadchurch panel to say goodbye to the mystery drama from across the pond. We'll be launching a new panel covering Lemony Snicket's Unfortunate Events and Sensate, which is getting a finale episode in the future, so we're not going to be looking back at it. And our Buffyverse panel will continue the five-part series covering Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel with episodes three through five. What's more, CPU is going live again! We've been planning some live events, as I've repeatedly been alluding to in these introductions, and we're super excited about them. CPU is coming up on our 100th episode. We're ready for syndication, baby! Just kidding. What we're not kidding about, however, is that we have a special live event coming up on October 2nd to celebrate our 100th episode, which will, in the spirit of live events, actually be in front of a live studio audience. Stay tuned for those details. We also have more live appearances and other cool stuff being planned, so make sure you like us at our Facebook page, our Twitter, follow us at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, and or our Pinterest at CPU Podcast, or subscribe to the blog, our YouTube channel, our iTunes channel, our Stitcher Radio channel, or find us on Google Play. In the meantime, if you don't hear your show in this podcast format, fellow panelists and I still write reviews, and we're always seeking new panelists. So if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any of those outlets I've mentioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback, so just leave us feedback. We'll give you feedback, too, because we're helpful like that. Today, we're around the water cooler and discussing the second half of Season 4 of Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which airs September through May, at least currently, on ABC. The fourth season finale aired on May 16, 2017. To refresh the listener, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a serial television drama created for ABC by Joss and Jed Whedon, as well as Marissa Tangerowan, based upon the Marvel comic and cinematic universe. S.H.I.E.L.D., or the Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division, is a fictional peacekeeping and spy agency in a world of superheroes and aliens. The agency's mission is to monitor and collect rogue supernatural subjects, forces, and people, and to control them. The show is set in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or MCU, sharing continuity with the films and other television series of the franchise. The series revolves around the character of Phil Coulson, with Clark Gregg reprising his role from the film series, and his team of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who must deal with various unusual cases and enemies. The series also stars Ming-Na Wen, Chloe Bennett, Ian DeCastecker, and Elizabeth Henstridge, with Henry Simmons and John Hanna. For a more detailed plot summary, listen to prior podcast episodes about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., or check out our other S.H.I.E.L.D. entries on the blog. 
If you didn't already know, you can click the floating box at the top right of the header, the picture with the TV watcher, and search for any blog entry or prior podcast episode, which is futuristic technology at its finest. For now, our esteemed group of S.H.I.E.L.D. panelists, which has grown a bit, she says, with all the excitement, Kristen, Jen, and one voice new to the panel, but not to the podcast, are back around the water cooler to discuss the second half, or maybe it's more like the second two-thirds, of season four, with two story arcs entitled LMD and Agents of Hydra. Before we do, I want to take a moment to first introduce our new panelist, and second, to double-check our returning panelist temperature. After all, as we all know, sometimes a TV show can take turns for the better or the worse in our heads, or could continue its level of awesomeness or lack thereof, depending upon its story evolution. As always, it should be noted that all of our panelists have viewed the entire show to date, and will, let's face it, discuss sensitive plot points. So for those of you who are not caught up on S.H.I.E.L.D., listen at your own risk, as there are going to be major spoilers. Welcome back, returning panelists, and welcome to the new panelist. How are you hello, all hello. today? Thank you. Hi! Hello. Hi! All right, so just as I said in the intro, as I always say in the intro, what we're going to do at this point, I'm going to be taking the returning panelist temperature, introducing our new panelist, and it goes like this. Are you ready? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because S.H.I.E.L.D. is your life? You believe the show has purpose? It means something and the agency is damn good. Also, this group of ragtag fighters and agents in charge of curbing supernatural extraterrestrial global threats has become something of a family to you, like Phil Coulson. Do you watch it because you're a dutiful soldier and loyal, especially to Phil Coulson, or maybe the Whedons, like Melinda May? Do you watch it and have found renewed love for it? It was a tough go there for a minute, particularly after two of your favorite characters, spoiler, died, which are specifically Ward and Lincoln, but you realize that the writers really know what they're doing enough to bring you back into the fold, despite your better judgment, and now you are prepared to defend it, even save it from itself, if needed, like Daisy, a.k.a. Quake. Do you watch it for all the awesome fictional technology, or because your girlfriend, the real one, and the one posing as Madame Hydra, also watch it, like Leo Fitz? Or do you watch it for all the radical science, real or fake, or because your boyfriend watches it, and you are worried that it might be giving him ideas on how to be a darker, less desirable, evil version of himself, like Gemma Simmons? Do you watch it because you want to protect those you care about, keep people safe, and shield them from pain you live with every day, and this show gives you the tools to do that, like Alfonso Mac McKenzie? Or do you watch it but only distractedly so, or don't watch it anymore, as you're ultimately only interested in your god complex and in your secret construction of a simulation matrix in which to transfer yours and everyone else's consciousness, and or because, spoiler, you died or disappeared from the collapsing framework you built, like Holden Radcliffe. I am Jen. Hi, Jen. And I think that I am pretty much all of them. What? I know. No, how can that be possible? You have to narrow it down. <laughs> I have to limit myself I'm, to two. Okay, except for maybe Holden, the last one. Well, that's good. And so you haven't died. Yeah. <laughs> that's really good news. You haven't disappeared from the framework. Yeah, I think I'm all of the other ones, though. <laughs> I can't. Well, you have to justify <laughs> Maybe that. a little bit of <laughs> Mac, but mostly, I, I don't remember what last... What I was last time. You mm-hmm. were last time. I have the answer I think to I, this was question. Was it Fitz and Gemma, uh, Gemma? Both you and Kristen mm-hmm. were Fitz, Simmons, and... I want to say I was Coulson. You were not Coulson no. last no, time. No, I think because we were kind of on the fence Oh, you're last right. Time. You're right, because it was... Mm, yeah. It was, it I think you were just point. Fitz and Simmons. I think so. so. Well, now I'm adding Coulson, and I feel like I'm a dutiful soldier because I've been watching it all this time and I've kept with it. So, so you're I Melinda. Would be yeah. Melinda so that makes me those four, the first four, right? And Coulson. Oh, and, and Daisy. Daisy. Because <laughs> I, I found a renewed love for it because I was, yeah, because I was on the fence and was kind of, uh, but now this last part, I've gotten more into it, and it's, yeah, I found another renewed Love for it. So you're Coulson, May, Fitz, Simmons, and Daisy. Yes. That is some kind of dissociative personality disorder. <laughs> hey, in the Supernatural podcast, I have at least three or four of them. There's only four in oh, that wow. That's all of them. <laughs> That's all of them, then. Jen, we're so. going to have to work on this. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kristen. Hi, Kristen. 
I? Last time you were Fitz and Simmons. Last too. time I was, but I think for the first time ever in the history of recording this podcast, I'm only going to choose one character. What? I usually, <laughs> if you listen to the 85 bajillion other podcasts that I'm on with Kylie, I usually choose two. Today I'm at only, least. I'm at least. Today I'm only choosing one. Wow, Nick would be so proud of I you. I know. <laughs> I know. I am a solid daisy right now. You know, I've found a renewed love for it. This, these two parts of 4B, are we on 4B? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so the LMD, the Life Model Decoy arc was heading in the right direction. But then the framework or the agents of Hydra like sucked me in and I absolutely loved it. So if they keep going the way they have been for the past handful of episodes... I've got a renewed love for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., so put me down as a solid daisy and quake. Okay. She says with enthusiasm. I do. I'm excited. (laughs) Before I talk about myself, we have a new panelist. Woohoo! You might have heard his voice on our Once Upon a Time podcast. So, new panelist, what I'd like you to do is tell us your first name. You know how this works. And then tell us how you came to watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. What made you start watching? What kept you watching? How did you find out about it? How are you here now? And then pick one of those, or multiple, as people, as apparently Jen, <laughs> might do. <laughs> pick the characters. Go. Well, hello. My name is Micah. As you said, I've been previously been heard on the Once Upon a Time podcast. Hashtag potential. Drink! <laughs> as far as Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., once I didn't get into two for quite a while, but Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., like, Avengers came out and the world blew up because it was the greatest superhero movie they'd ever seen. And, like, as soon as they announced that Joss Whedon was making uh, just, a, like, a day-to-day show about S.H.I.E.L.D., I was, I was immediately on board. I was ready for it. And when it came out, I mean, it's, it's a tough show for people to start because of that first half of the, se- of the first season because they had to wait for Winter Soldier to come out before they could drop some plot bombs in the show without spoiling anything for the movies. But I've I've been watching since the first day. I think what has kept me watching the most is Sky, which she's called Daisy, which will always be Sky to me. Her character development has been just in the grand scheme of television shows. As far as like a main character goes, her character development, I think, has been extremely well handled. It's been evenly paced, but she's also kept amping up her skill set first from going to a hacker to being an actual field agent and now she has inhuman powers but they still will harken back to those other skill sets as well they're not just moving on from one to the next i've been a route for me in the show also i was going to say my character identifier for this one is colson because i've just i've even in the slower parts, I've loved it since day one, and I definitely do love the ensemble as a family. There were some people, obviously, that I was sad to see them go, but we did get to see a couple of familiar faces back in this season half, but we'll, we'll get to that later. We, but yeah, Colson all the way. Well, welcome to the panel, Micah. We're excited to have you here. And just to cover my bases, of course, I'm Kylie. I'm both moderating and participating today, which I feel I have to say more often as more people start to moderate. <laughs> I Last time, I think I was also Fitzsimmons. I don't think I was anybody else, and I didn't tweak a lot of these. This time, I think I would be both Melinda, May, and Daisy. I wrote Daisy with myself in mind. I think I did find a renewed love for the show after the first half of the season where I wasn't quite sure where that was going. It paid off big time in the second half and kind of reeled me back in, as Kristen said. And I also find the Daisy character like a thousand times more interesting again, as opposed to how I felt about her in the first half of the season, which we'll talk about that we have in our last podcast episode about this show. But also I be Melinda because I am I am a dutiful soldier and I am loyal to Phil Coulson and I am loyal to the show. I don't see after having watched it all this time good or bad, I I don't know that I would now actually stop watching. Now I feel like I'd have to complete it based on this half of the (laughs) season. I have to know what happens. So we've, we've skated past that scary point for some of us. And now we're on a good trajectory. And we're going to talk about season 4B, which was jam packed this time because there were two story arcs. The first half of the season focused exclusively well, mainly exclusively, their hashtag was Ghostwriter. This season they had two, and it was split into half, and there was a little bit of a hiatus in between the two halves. 
And so we're going to approach the two halves separately. Even though they all kind of moved and coalesced, there was a lot of stuff that happened in the LMD half, and there was a lot of stuff, a lot more stuff, that happened in the agents of hybrid half. So just to keep the discussion in kind of a logical flow, we're going to do it that way. But I'm going to ask you, you can talk overall for a moment how you feel about season four as a whole now that you've seen the whole thing. How do, how do you feel it paid off season four in the end and where the show is right now? I definitely think it picked it up. Yeah, 4B and, is know, by far yeah. the better half. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very concise. <laughs> concise and agreeable. Yeah, I, I remember when I was catching up and I was watching the LMD cycle. I remember watching like the closer of that before they went on the mini hiatus and I actually text Kylie. I'm like, is this it? Is this where we stop? What's going on? I need more. So that was a good sign. I haven't wanted more of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in a long time. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think if they continue on their path, they're going to make a strong season five. Yeah, I agree. LMD arc kind of, it kind of started to drag a little bit as far as, I mean, dealing with Season we just left, which was the Hive arc, which was definitely not not slow in its in its ending. It was a bit of a, a pace change, but they were just like looking at the whole season in retrospect. They were doing the work that I think they needed to do in order to make Agents of Hydra as cool as it was. Because like sometimes this TV show can just be a wild ride, beginning to start for the season and still get those setups in. But sometimes you just gotta put in your due diligence at the writing table. I agree with all of that. This is going to be an exciting podcast. <laughs> I agree exactly with that. I mean, I was really doubtful after 4A, which I thought was a, pace, a, a huge pacing issue. That's a good way to describe it, especially what we said in our last podcast episode was how they had built up, built up, built up. They gave the high arc, which was, it felt like a climax in many ways, and it felt like they were starting over in the 4A piece of this season and while I think we talked about extensively in our last episode Ghost Rider as a character was cool it was hard mm-hmm. to see how he fit in the overall narrative or how yeah. him and the dark hole piece fit together or how any of it was going to progress especially after they still haven't satisfactorily explained to my level of satisfaction why they needed to do the six month time jump or why, yeah. you know, yeah, that they still landed in the place they did. But at the, at the very least, I felt like <laughs> maybe I don't care about that anymore because of the way 4B happened. You know, because they set up all of these possibilities and this idea of the framework and maybe even seeded, and we'll talk about that, a return of Hydra. Not that they can ever really die if we believe mm-hmm. in what Hydra is supposed to be. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's how I feel as well. So let's kind of parse this out. And let's talk about the two different parts because they were both jam-packed in many ways and with different plot points. They all intersected and interwove. But starting with the LMD half of this half of the season, what did you think about some of the things that happened? In this half of the season, we have the whole, you know, Senator Nadir was still on her, manhunt for Inhumans along with the Watchdogs who were also staffed by former agents of HYDRA. We had sort of the the Jeffrey Mace reveal, which was Jen predicted in our last podcast. She didn't trust him. She thought he was hiding something. She was right. (laughs) (laughs) There was also the idea that Radcliffe, along with Ada, his LMD, who they thought they had put her away in the closet, but in fact there was another one, and she was making <laughs> she was making more, and one of them was the Melinda May that we mm-hmm. see in S.H.I.E.L.D., which then became others. So there were a lot of things happening. Also, I, I feel like I have to, because so much time was spent on it, point to the Mac and Yo-Yo relationship. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So... What do we think about all of this stuff? Start talking. It's a podcast. When did that relationship develop? Because I don't really remember them. It started a little in like 4A. I didn't catch it. They were flirting in yeah. 4A. I guess I, yeah, I just, totally missed it. It's been progressing it since the character of Yo-Yo has been introduced. It's just been a, like a slow Real burn. Subtle? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I didn't get that at all. So when it was like, obvious, like you know, oh... When did this happen? <laughs> when did it occur? I felt like I had lost, or maybe I missed an episode or something. But 
No? No, I just didn't no. catch it. You yeah. just didn't catch it. How do you feel about it? <laughs> <laughs> that was like um, she was going over her head. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> I like to do gestures. And I know nobody can see me. Okay. <laughs> How did I feel about it? Yeah. I I did not not like it, I guess. But I didn't like, yay, you know. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. It's a, kind of, for me, it's like a weird, kind of a weird combination. I don't know. It didn't, <clears throat> it doesn't fit for me, I guess. But I don't, I mean, I'm okay with it, but, <laughs> yeah. well, now. See, I'm, I'm kind of a total, the opposite. I really, I really like it. I like mm-hmm. that, that Mac and Yo-Yo kind of have a thing. It gives another, I don't know, it gives a lo- another level of interest to both of their storylines. And I, I think when we start talking about the framework or the Agents of Hydra portion, I think I'll get into a little more detail there about why that subplot made that arc a little more interesting for me too but i think i'm a fan i think maybe it's because i don't really care for the character yo-yo i mean she's all right but she's not you know that might be why i love mac but that might be why like i feel like there should be more suited character stronger somebody like daisy but not daisy but that like that (laughs) no 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 but you know i mean like that that strong i don't know Maybe if they have her, they're having her more and more on, you know, that might be what too. Because she really <laughs> wasn't, she was kind of a in and out character. She wasn't always. Well, she was, but that part, but partly part, that's because Daisy was recruiting in humans. Yeah. She yeah. Was yeah. In humans. yeah. Now she's stuck around because she's the only one left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. I disagree with Jen, but also agree with her a little bit. This season definitely had the most, like, if you like shipping, there was definitely a lot more shipping fodder than. Yep. In other seasons. And I agree that, like, for Mac, I kind of envisioned him with someone like Daisy. In fact, I used to ship the two of them back before because, truth be told, I don't know if I'm going to hurt anybody's feelings, not a Lincoln fan. Like, he was a nice member of the team, but as far as their relationship, maybe it was just on-screen chemistry, but I wasn't feeling it. It never really seemed like it actually fit. So I was definitely okay with Daisy and Max starting to have a relationship, but that ended up being nothing. Yeah, no, once Ghost Rider stepped on the scene, the chemistry that she had with him, that actually played really well, and then opened it up, so I was looking more at, like, I I definitely noticed Yo-Yo and Max flirtations going on, which I think, if I'm remembering correctly, was more led by her, Mm -hmm. which I like because that kind of gave us a really early setup for what was going on with him and hope and the reasons why he might not be eager to get into another relationship so no i'm definitely i don't really know how to combine their names mac yo yoma i don't know <laughs> what you want to say but yeah i'm a fan I'm, I'm interested to see where it goes yeah i like them i think i don't know that i've personally ever shipped anyone other than Fitzsimmons on the show. Uh, of course. Of course, because duh. <laughs> but I, I like that pairing, Yo-Yo and Mac. I think I agree with Kristen and I agree with Micah. It adds dimension to their character. The slow burn was kind of seated. They didn't act on it right away, so it seemed very organic. Mm-hmm. I do like Yo-Yo. I think she's got a cool power. I mean, she runs and she comes back and then she gets a cool nickname. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I guess she doesn't. <laughs> I'm just not a big fan, that's all. But, you know, and I also agree that the payoff for them, especially in the Agents of Hydra arc, which we'll get to, that made it all the more resonant. But they weren't the only piece. That was the fluff piece. <laughs> what about the less fluffy stuff? I almost wonder, if Ada hadn't needed to read the dark hold would she have done the things that she did because i know she was as an android she was a little more skewed to the evil side of things as she was becoming you know more self-aware and we've heard the recent stories of artificial intelligence oh. going a little further than they should but i almost wonder if they wouldn't have needed her to read the text because a human can't read it would she have done the things that she did and would the agents of hydra arc even happened i don't know that she would so first, I'm going to sort of take a slight issue with she was skewing evil pre-Darkhold. She was efficient. She was ruthless. She was a yeah. robot. But to ascribe evil to her, I feel like that's strong because I don't think until she read the Darkhold, she had any capacity mm-hmm. to comprehend that. It was after she read the Darkhold, which started expanding her programming and allowing her to break through programming that Radcliffe was instilling mm-hmm. in her, that suddenly you could ascribe evil to some of okay. her choices. I mean, why choose to be Madame Hydra otherwise, right? Yeah. I think part of that was programming 
pre-Dark Hole was programming for her, and that came solely from Radcliffe, who is a likable character. Yeah, so no. now we get into the complexities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> This is why I'm so impressed with the second half of this season because there are a lot of layers, lots of kind mm-hmm. of philosophical toyings yeah. on with the different characters. Nobody's, you know, totally lawful good. Nobody's mm-hmm. totally yeah. unlawful bad or whatever the other corner is. <laughs> lots of gray. Lots of gray, lots of shades of gray, even yeah. for our heroes. So to answer your question, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> there isn't I don't know about that because mm-hmm. she did read the dark hole. What is the dark hold? Does anybody, can anybody kind of, other than it's a book with mystical <laughs> shit in it, I mean mystical stuff in it, <laughs> what is the dark hold? Where did it come from? Where, I know this is jumping ahead, but where did Robbie go and come back from? Well, yeah. as he described it, hell is relative, and since there's all these different planets and dimensions in the known universe that... Well, let's just say there's there's more than one. So he was in a sp- particular one. Their explanation of the dark hole, like they they did a pretty good job with it in the the arc before, where his uncle was using it to create dark matter. But they kind of well, they just had a lot to juggle with this arc, so they didn't go into it super deeply. But as far as I can understand it, it is made of dark matter. The Ghost Rider is also made of dark matter, but. I think the Darkhold, more than anything we've seen, even like in the Thor movies, is a very tight marriage of technology and magic. They almost there's almost no line between them with when you're dealing with the Darkhold, so it's hard to tell. Yeah, I just did a little quick googling on the magical Wikipedia machine, and it that's two machines. It is Google two machines, but I did, but I used the Google and it pointed me to the Wikipedia. <laughs> so, and this is for Marvel in general. The Darkhold is also known as the Book of Spells or the Book of Sins. It's just a nasty, horrible, evil book. Does it come out of a particular franchise? Let me check. Because I just, you know, again, for the listener and the people in the room, I started DC. Mm -hmm. I'm just caught up on the MCU. (laughs) So I don't know all these things. It was first mentioned in the comic Marvel Spotlight number three, which Hmm. was published in May of 1972, but it wasn't shown for the first time until the Spotlight number four in June 1972. There was also a small series called Darkhold, Pages from the Book of Sins, which ran for 16 issues from 1992 through 1994. It was its own comic? It was its own... Relate to anything? Many thing, yeah. It's... Apparently there was a demonic god in this marvel universe who was the earth's first practitioner of black magic and he was the one who actually authored the dark hold so this is kind of way for him to write down all of his knowledge about what he could do with dark magic or dark matter and share it with his followers or with i don't know it's very confusing there's something with vampires and werewolves and there's other Zombies. I just scrolled past something with zombies. Oh, wow. So a lot of evil people have possessed the dark hold over the course of Marvel history mm-hmm. since its induction in the early or introduction in the early seventies. That's all I can give you. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, I, I just had to ask that question because it was so important to the story, <laughs> and I didn't. You know, I mean, I suspended disbelief, but then when the book passed so many through so many hands, mm-hmm. and based on your question, I just had to ask it. What else about the LMD piece? Or are you all waiting to get to Agents of Hydra on bated breath? <laughs> no, I think, I think the LMD piece is pretty important, too, because it showed us... Well, they did kill Ada, and then Fitz mm-hmm. was, like, working on her head secretly, trying to bring her back to life or yeah. get her information. I think that kind of planted the seeds for parts of the Agents of Hydra arc with Ada and Fitz's relationship that she created in the framework. But it just, I think it also kind of shows you Ada and AI can't always be killed that easily. You have to be careful about what you create and what happens when they get a mind of their own. It's very appropriate for current times. One of the parts of the LMD arc that was really a part of the, one of the parts of the season that I didn't like because it was a very solid season, but after a while, the character of the, of the superior just really wasn't doing it for me. Like, I'd seen that actor on Shameless where he played a very fun and interesting character. He was but... also on the pirate show. And who was this? His real name is Zach McGowan. He, he's Ivanov is the name we come to mm-hmm. learn. Mm, okay. He's the superior. Yep, yep. Okay, thank you. The Russian. Yeah, he just got a little dry for me oh, after a yeah. while. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. That clicked. That clicked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Russian. I agree. He did get a little dry mm-hmm. after a while. It's just kind of like, why is he still sticking around after all this time? He kind of served his purpose. Let's move on. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. they just needed a mustache twirler in the wings. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, because that's really how he played. Yeah. And then when he proliferated and was multiple different LMDs on his own submarine, it was, yeah, a mm-hmm. little tedious. That yeah. part was tedious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His acting opposite Mallory Jensen as Ada slash Ophelia slash Agnes slash everybody. <laughs> I mean, I he, he just wasn't in the same league as her, so it was kind of like mm-hmm. hard to buy into their scenes a little bit. I also I was a little unsettled towards the end of this LMD arc when I believe it was Daisy and I don't remember who was with her when they walked into the warehouse of all the LMDs of yeah. the main shield agents that Ada had created in advance and, prepping for mm. you know mm-hmm. taking them and as each agent was slowly picked off and being replaced the audience kind of knew it but the characters didn't know it and that I don't know that was just when she walked through the warehouse that was so unsettling so to kind of Ugh. walk through these plot points that we're hitting on real quick, what happens is Ada, after she reads the Dark Hold, what she does in the first half of the season, she's she's expanding so much. And Radcliffe, in the meantime, is creating the framework on the fly, right? He's doing this for his own personal reason, which we'll get to in a second. But Ada, in answer to that programming, is slowly and surely building duplicates of all the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, starting with Melinda May. May was mm-hmm. the first yep. replacement. And they keep her locked away in a closet and hooking her up to, like, the proto framework yeah. for a while. Where she's, it's hilarious to me that she keeps breaking the boundaries of those early versions. Mm-hmm. And Ada keeps coming back to Radcliffe and saying, she just, she with admiration... She just keeps exceeding the programming. You know? <laughs> well, it's because they started putting her into a spa. At first, and Ada's yeah. like, oh, wait, she's not programmed to relax. She's programmed to fight, <laughs> so we need to give her stuff to fight, and she'll think that it's real. Right. That was yeah. hysterical. <laughs> and true. Very true. Very true. Very true. <laughs> so in the meantime, yeah, there, there gets to be this realization, not to mention the fact what Kristen is alluding to with Fitz kind of poking around the one Ada that they have in their mm-hmm. possession he, he learns some things, not the least of which is Radcliffe is, do, you know, full knowledge, doing this on purpose, creating this other stuff. And then we find out Radcliffe is also an LMD. The one that they mm-hmm. have mm-hmm. at S.H.I.E.L.D. is also an LMD. And he plants seeds like, for example, he refreshes us of Fitz's relationship with his father mm-hmm. yeah. and makes a comment to the effect of, I know your father, I know the father that, for I have met him, and all this kind of thing. So there's a gradual replacement. And it actually starts with looking at one of those containment cars full of Daisy replicas. Yeah. And then it just builds into something even mm-hmm. more. So what do we think about all of those developments? I was actually kind of surprised that Radcliffe ended up being an LMD I guess just because you don't expect the mastermind himself to be a pawn in the game. And as we saw, he ultimately, the real Radcliffe, even became quite a useful pawn for Ada and inside of the framework. But yeah, I remember like after they had, she had first used the dark hold, opening that portal, she was building a brain out of the light. And I thought that when we saw that May was now in the framework and replaced. I thought that that was the only one. So I definitely wasn't expecting a Radcliffe replacement at that point. Yeah, I was definitely shocked by the revelation that Radcliffe was an LMD for the same reason that Micah said. You you don't expect the mastermind Mm -hmm. to not be the mastermind, and it's really his second that is controlling everything. I loved that twist. I thought it was a great setup. I mean, I felt this whole LMD arc was a great setup just so they could do the framework. But the breadcrumbs that they placed that Kylie had talked about with this LMD Radcliffe talking about Fitz's father and reminding us of little odds and ends that played such a huge part in the framework art was genius and loved it. Give me more. I I agree that I didn't see the Radcliffe art coming, but at the same time, it ended up making sense to me in the end because Radcliffe is kind of a coward, you know? He's he's a mastermind, Mm -hmm. but he's also... He's afraid of death. That's why he wants immortality. <laughs> so putting himself out of harm's way was, I didn't see it coming, but at the same time, it landed pretty quickly mm-hmm. for me. Like, okay, 
Yep. <laughs> I guess I can see him doing that. That's just another like example of good writing is when you have a plot twist that the audience doesn't expect, but once it's there, it makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. It's not something you just pulled out of your hat. What about that scene when Fitz and Simmons, who they're both at the time playing at, they know that others are being replaced, and they have each other pinned in a corner in a room by themselves, Fitz thinking, quote-unquote, thinking that Simmons oh, is Oh, yeah. yeah. And Simmons vice versa. What do we think I about didn't, that? I wasn't sure who was... Who was who. Yeah, who was real and who wasn't. It had me confused. Mm -hmm. I had an inkling it was Fitz. (laughs) That was the LMD. Just because Simmons was talking about it earlier, and that was the first time he was really introduced into the equation. Plus, he can turn on a dime so quickly. Mm -hmm. Ian can turn on a dime and has in the past. (laughs) I have to say about Fitz, I think this season four B, whatever, really showed his capability as an I, actor. I agree. He just mm-hmm. I've always liked his character, mm-hmm. but I just fell in love with his character mm-hmm. after this. I they mean, gave him something so good really good actor. to do. Yeah, that he oh, he's just he's a really good actor. Yeah. And I'm really glad that he got to be, you know, got to show that. I agree. Mm-hmm. Fitz is my favorite. He's mine now. Yeah. <laughs> Fitz has always been my favorite, and I'm glad he's not evil permanently, but yeah. we'll get there. Now, jumping back to, because we were talking about Mac, one of the reasons that I like him so much and what quickly made him part of this the agent's family was in dealing with Fitz post-drowning mm-hmm. when his brain was injured. Like, Mac was the only mm-hmm. one who was, like, taking yeah. the time and now seeing... It, it was kind of like a father-to-son relationship there just a little bit, and we can even see more now that, like, Mac was probably benefiting from that relationship just as much as Oh, Fitz. yeah, for sure. Yeah. I really like how all of the characters... That's the, the thing that I think they've done the best over the course of the four seasons and really kind of hit home for us in this season is how each of the characters have formed bonds of particular types of rapport with the other characters so that by the end of it, when they do say family, you buy that because yeah. in many ways they do function like a family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's a dysfunctional one, but, mm-hmm. you know, that's what happens when you're fighting the supernatural and the <laughs> yeah. extraterrestrial, I guess. <laughs> oh, I did like that we got to stop off once again with the, the Koenig brothers and sister as we got to meet her as well. Yes. yes. And then with LMDs on the table, we I think all of us were like, oh, that's what. But they just ended up being biological twins, which was a nice, it was a nice little comedic break. Are there, they twins so. or are they triplets? Because there was the other brother or that wasn't around. quintuplets, I don't Yeah, they're, <laughs> they are all human. This is but, a character mm-hmm. played by Patton Oswalt. All the characters played by oh, Patton Oswalt. Give, the sister. give me more Patton Oswalt <laughs> in this show. I He's love got a new show coming out. I though. know. I love him in these little bits and pieces, though. You can tell that he just really likes being part of this Marvel universe. And mm-hmm. I know I like each different iteration they have. And introducing the sister, it was just perfect. She was the perfect foil for Patton Oswalt's more bumbling brother in this one and yeah that was a fun little bit of comedic relief with trying to secure the dark hold did we want to talk about nadir at all i mean i know that that's part of the story got cleaned up a little i'm happy she's gone (laughs) she was getting really annoying it just because she was turning on her brother because it wasn't her brother revealed to be inhuman inhuman, Mm -hmm. and she was double facing it she was saying one thing to the media then she was doing the watchdog stuff behind everybody's back and yeah i'm i'm so glad they cleaned that part up they kind of set her up as i'm the name is failing me right now but in the 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 inhumans are essentially the marvel companion for the mutant race which marvel can't use because sony technically owns that term so this has pretty much been their cheat code of how to bring mutants into the the x-men yeah it's fox Mm -hmm. fox owns the x-men sony owns spider oh i'm sorry Mm -hmm. we got you but yeah they because of the contract thing they they can't use mutants because that's exclusive to the x-men but yes they're Mm -hmm. all the same race of extra special people extra special yeah Yep. And there's always been the one senator that's always trying to introduce anti-mutant legislation. So I mm-hmm. felt like Nadir was kind of their version of that for the Inhumans, except even taking it one step further to have under-the-table dealings with the Watchdogs. But the main thing that I was happy that she got brought in for was her brother, because as we saw, he 
emerged from slowly emerged from his teragenesis and then once he was shot and fell into the water he entered a second one and i was thinking we were going to see him again this season but i'm hoping since they didn't that we see him back as he might be an inhuman who just whatever way he is harmed he will tear a genesis an immunity to that is what me and some other friends were discussing it and think that mm. that might be a possibility and that would be knowing that inhuman abilities develop for a reason like lash developed to fight hive mm-hmm. i'm wondering what we would need an inhuman that can't be permanently killed in order to fight in the future yeah because didn't they say earlier on that there's always a balance Mm-hmm. Like in like inhumans are created to balance certain things or to balance each other in different ways, so that mm-hmm. would yeah I didn't think about that. That's I didn't even realize that he was Terra Genesising Genesising <laughs> again again yeah I didn't when catch he fell into the water I didn't catch that. Mm-mm. I, I like have, that theory. Yeah, I do like that theory. Mm-hmm. The the piece about the the Nadir storyline that I thought was incredibly ironic and well written was the idea that Shockley, the leader of the Watchdogs. I mean, she, she gets into bed with them. They're clearly, you know, your, your run-of-the-mill terrorist, mm-hmm. clearly allegorical to our current times <laughs> about, you know, conservative pockets of, of the place, of, of our country. So he, in his way, I, I, you know, there's lots of kind of build-up to this, but he plans on basically calling her out. He thinks that she's an inhuman because her mm-hmm. brother was an inhuman. He storms into her office with a Terrigen crystal, slams it down for the idea of exposing mm-hmm. her inhumanness, and then ends up turning into an inhuman himself. himself. Yeah, and one that has the power of exploding into a gas and then reconstituting himself, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is quite a power. Well, he did have a very explosive personality. He did. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that part of it, I really enjoyed a lot, and I also like how they. Daisy had, they, they figured out that if Daisy quaked him long enough and tired him out, they ended up bringing in this vacuum. <laughs> yeah, it was very Ghostbusters-like. It was a little mm-hmm. It was a little Ghostbusters. And sucking him in. <laughs> Where he will remain, I guess, until they need to let him out. I don't know. Or he escapes somehow, or somebody breaks him out. Probably. Yeah. I mean, if there's, they'll just have to come up for a name for the evil side of mutants, like their their version of Magneto, mm-hmm. I guess. And then what about the Jeffrey Mace reveal? That he wasn't really an inhuman, he was just getting these shots of special steroids? Yeah, I was a little surprised by it. I, yeah. I was going to ask yeah. you first, Jen, since you didn't trust the man. I didn't yeah. trust the man, but I wasn't expecting that. I mean, I I, would, I thought he was an inhuman. I didn't think, you know, they did they ever hint to having stuff like shots that you can take and become an inhuman? No, that no. mostly came that out this came, half Right, yeah. so that's, I think that's where I was so shocked. I didn't know they had that capability, mm-hmm. you know. Well, and they say, Talbot says that they've been experimenting with. Right. It's like another, it, yeah, it's like yeah. Super Serum 2.0. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it was a modified version of the Hyde serum that Daisy's father used back when he was still trying to take down the people who killed his wife mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. Yeah. killed his wife. Yeah. 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 Okay. I was definitely expecting it to be more since all of like Tony Stark essentially started the MCU. I was thinking that his super strength was from the suit itself rather than, you know, a life threatening shot. I feel like maybe their R and D department should have tried to look into that instead of killing the guy, but but you know. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> well, yeah. what we learn about the, the non-special people side of this is that they're kind of messed up. <laughs> yeah. The military and the government. So you weren't mm-hmm. expecting that, Jen. You, but how'd you feel about it? They killed him off, so <laughs> it was fine. Spoiler. <laughs> That's not till the framework. Well, sorry. Yeah, I I mean, I I was okay with it. I I didn't have a problem, but it was like, huh, that's interesting. I don't know why they just said, maybe they're going to use that later on. You know, maybe people are going to get their hands on these injections and and turn themselves into, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, May uses something in the framework. Well, yeah, that's true. She She does. does. Yeah. 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 Special steroids. Special Which I like that, actually. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, you go me. You're super <laughs> tough. Yeah. You kick ass anyway, but now you really kick ass. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I'd like to talk about segueing into the Agents of Hydra, part of it is that we actually learn why Radcliffe is trying to create the framework, and that we also learn that Ada is, in fact, based on a real-life 
version. His former love, Agnes, who we find out is dying of some sort of cancer, although I think it's heavily implied that it's brain cancer. Coulson and Mac find her, and there's this whole episode about them trying to convince her to help them because they're trying to find May because, oh, by the way, Coulson and May <laughs> yeah. during this season, although it's Coulson... And, and the, the robot. robot. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of gross. But the robot reflects the real person's brain, right? So, just saying. Anyway. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but they did also say that because of her like subconscious programming to get the dark hold, I mean, getting close to Coulson could have also just been strategic. Part of her way. directive. So, yeah, as much yeah. as I, I'm with you, I want to believe that by the end of this series, we will have those two... As a, as a couple, I don't think that... I think it was more robot-fueled than May-fueled, I think, for that perspective. Maybe, but at the same time, at the end of this arc, May is programmed to blow up a bomb and to kill all of the remaining non-LMD agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Daisy and Simmons, when they're trying to escape to go plug themselves in the framework to save everybody, encounter her... And May lets them go by and then blows up the headquarters with all the LMDs. And this is the May LMD mm-hmm. herself inside it. So is it really robot fuel all the way? I don't know. I think unless we're saying that the May LMD became her own entity all by itself, I don't know. It created with the dark hole. We don't really have the definite rule book on that. But yeah. I definitely think that could have been possible. Yeah, because the robot May definitely at the end showed emotion and robots i would think have have that right all right they yeah. just do what they're told or programmed and and everything and she obviously you know showed that emotion so like i said the dark hope we don't know how it affects them different so are they really robots they're more well and then ada evolved and mm-hmm. evolved yeah and, and evolved. she kept evolving yeah to the point where she actually built herself a body that she could experience <laughs> these emotions We'll get to that, of course. That's Agents of Hyder part. But <laughs> I'm just saying it's more complicated than that. And May was real pissed when she learned that Coulson cracked open the scotch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> with with fake her. A fake hit her. I mean, that's something they've been saving for a very long time. Mm-hmm. So I'm just saying, but anyway. Now that you mention it, I think... Because we did see that Radcliffe made the Radcliffe or Ada made the choice to not have the May LMD know that she was an LMD, mm-hmm. and maybe like awareness of being a machine. Because we saw the way that it affected Ada; she was constantly, even back in the early days, comparing herself to humans and like trying to find what could make her human. But maybe not letting the LMD know that it was artificial is what kind of gave it the ability to like branch off and kind of become a true may in its own way i buy that (laughs) (laughs) i buy that because he does say that and with the other lmd replacements for shield agents like coulson and fitz Mm -hmm. and mace they were all self-aware and so any emotion that they showed really was to serve the purpose of what they were trying to do as opposed to making a moral choice, which is what the May LMD ultimately did. I don't know. I'm just tossing it out there. But what did we think about the Agnes reveal? That's where I was originally starting. I'm not surprised. I wasn't surprised. No, not at all. Okay, good talk. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's like you kind of figured there's a a reason. Yeah, you know, I don't want to say it's typical because it's not really, but when something like that is created, there's... It's usually because of a loved one. So yeah. the loved one has died or is dying or, you know. Or they've been tragically or separated. Or you couldn't be or... with that person that you wanted to be, mm-hmm. so you create this, their image and stuff. You know what I mean? Like, it's, in these types of shows, it's kind of, like, you know, expected yeah. for there to be something by it. So one that revealed, I, I was not, I was not shocked at all. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't shocking. But I definitely think so. that actress who... I'm a big fan of Gallivant, so I was happy to see another yes. Gallivant yes. get out and into the mainstream. I think she definitely got to, I think, out of all the cast members, do the most. Like, her range for being Ada from start to finish mm-hmm. took her through the most places. I agree. Mm-hmm. She did a fantastic she job. She did. Yeah. She really did. She was good. And really mm-hmm. was the far more menacing force. 
Except maybe when Fitz turned evil. Yeah. <laughs> of all mm-hmm. the things that they experienced and that they encountered in this half season, I thought she truly was. You could feel a sense of her possibly being unbeatable while still hoping that she wasn't. And mm-hmm. just, you know, how far would she go? Well, clearly far, <laughs> you know. There was a lot of a lot of good conflict in that character and a lot of, yeah, great performance aspects to that character. Well, I feel like the, the push is to get to the Hydra piece. I think they'll be more exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, essentially, I've already alluded to it. Daisy and, and Gemma Simmons, they realize that all the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents are slowly being replaced by androids and figure out that there is the submarine out there where Ivanov is hiding out and where they are running this, they're calling it the framework. I don't know who uses the term first or how they even learn of it. But they make the decision to get on the Quinjet, hack into the framework, and plug themselves in to try to go save their friends, who are all trapped in there. Coulson's trapped, Fitz is trapped, Mace is trapped, everybody's trapped. Yeah, Mac and May and (laughs) everybody but those two. So then, when the the show took a little bit of a hiatus, when it returned from hiatus, it was a brand new world, and the following things were true in this brand new world. Hydra had control of the planet. They were snuffing out any inhuman they could find. S.H.I.E.L.D. was no longer in the picture. They had long since been conquered, if you will, by Hydra. Coulson is a middle school history teacher, passing on Hydra propaganda. May is, of course, a high-ranking Hydra agent, because what else would she be? Mac is hiding out from Hydra, caring for Hope, who we learned in the previous half season, well, actually earlier in this season, the LMD portion, that this was a daughter that died a few days after her birth, that he and his ex-wife continue to mourn on an annual basis. But in the framework, she lives and is 10 years old. Mace is inhuman and is going by the name the Patriot, which is what he was dubbing himself as sort of the fake inhuman face of S.H.I.E.L.D. before, and is leading a secret resistance using S.H.I.E.L.D.'s old headquarters. Radcliffe is hanging out with Agnes's consciousness because (laughs) both Radcliffe and Agnes have been uploaded uploaded and taken care of by Ada. Ada has transmorphed into Ophelia, otherwise known as... Madam Hydra positioned herself as the head of Hydra, or one of its heads. Fitz is her right-hand man and lover, going by the doctor. Plus, his dad is part of the organization, and they're really close, and it changes Fitz fundamentally. And then Daisy, when she discovers herself awoken in the framework, she is not only a high-ranking agent in Hydra going by her old name, Sky, which I'm sure made Micah happy, but also <laughs> is living with a now alive ward who also is an agent of Hydra, who also is a double agent. Because working. he can he can never not be a double agent. <laughs> right. That's right. Nope. Working for the resistance. And then Simmons, when she wakes up, and this I feel was like a reference to Buffy, claws her way out of an unmarked grave because she was previously murdered by Hydra. This is the world that we wake up to in the framework. Start talking about it. What'd you think? I felt bad for Simmons. I did too. <laughs> I did. I did too. I the mean, as soon as... had a cross. I know. It's like Claw as as, her way out. I know. As soon as they got into the framework and we see Daisy wake up with Ward and then the camera like zooms in on this plot of grass, I'm like, oh crap, here we go. Who's this guy? <laughs> here we go. <laughs> she's one Where's tough Simmons? cookie. That's all I well, say. well, especially as she's examining her clothes mm-hmm. and she sees... Like the gunshot wound and like the gunpowder stain, and it's like, oh, ma- really? That's why would how they, it went why would they kill Simmons? But it was, it was. I think more just from Ada slash Ophelia's desire just to have her out of the picture, so she gets Fitz all to herself, and she was forming a bond. Yeah, and then with Fitz once prior. she did get to Fitz, I just my heart was breaking every time because he wanted nothing to do with her, and it's and she's such a great actress. Like I wanted to cry every single time. It was just it was yeah. so good, but. Like, you know, Fitz, on, what's your problem? Yeah, on their, she didn't, he didn't yeah. know her. I know he didn't. And I know. Fr- in the framework, she died before he ever could meet her. But I, yeah. I, you know, I just wanted him to, yeah, yeah, know her. And then she was listed <laughs> as a traitor, and so everybody's mm-hmm. out to get her. And yeah. she had it rough. I feel this season, this part. 
Well, she's had it rough the whole oh, show, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but she's this the one that got stuck is... on the planet. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> she did. That's right. Simmons. She just lives to be the punch. She's <laughs> unlucky. On the other side of emotions for certain pairings, we then had Sky and Ward, which I... I was always I was a big fan of Ward in season one. He was part mm -hmm. of what helps yeah, like too. draw me to the show until his eventual you know double cross. But it was just fun to see her have to deal with that being her like framework identity as far as like oh hey babe want to get breakfast? She's like yeah. <laughs> sure. I know, babe. I <laughs> yeah. I was so happy to see Brett Dalton Me back. too. Oh, I, I miss him. Uh, I missed him too. Maybe they'll bring him back. <laughs> Again? Yeah. <laughs> Somehow they'll work yeah. this in. I don't know. I, don't know. I, really, I just really like I did. I did like the Sky and Ward pairing in the framework because that's something that I think a lot of the viewers wanted initially until he was evil or revealed to be evil. And so it was nice to kind of get that fandom moment of like, mm -hmm. oh, this is what it'd be like if they got together. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. Loved it. I, I thought yeah. that was so clever. It was very clever. What about, so my favorite part of this was Coulson's arc in this framework. <laughs> because yes. first of all, he was so paranoid. He oh was so God. paranoid. He made his own soap. Yeah, was soap. because he, he, was, he was convinced that Hydra was controlling people through the soap. the soap. Yes. And he knew, I mean, he was teaching the kids and, and you know, touting the company line, but then admitting when Simmons found him to, like, mm -hmm. try to say this isn't real. Try to wake him up, essentially. Yeah, he's admitting, you know, I've always felt this was wrong. <laughs> and just, he's so, he was very funny. Like, he's yeah. usually funny. He's usually got great one-liners. But, but he, he was, was genuinely like, funny. Genuinely uh -huh. funny, like, laid back, just cracking cracking me up yeah. all the time. I know, and we got another Tahiti reference. Yes. yes. Which was kind of a fun mm -hmm. little callback. Well, it was Tahiti that actually allowed him to, to wake up. Wake up a little bit because mm -hmm. Sky slash Daisy found him next and basically said, I'm just hoping you'll remember you're the closest thing I have to family. Yeah. And mm -hmm. boom, he's like, Daisy? And I was like, Oh that was nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was Tahiti. That yeah. was allowed That was the trigger. That. Yeah. Tahiti is a magical place. It is a magical place. <laughs> Speaking of throwbacks, my heart is the what really got me, punched me right in the chest was Trip. seeing our good friend Trip yes! again. Yes, yeah. I love Trip. Yeah. I love him. I love him. Oh, I miss him too <laughs> so much. And all the scenes with him and Simmons, I was like, oh, uh, I'm not supposed to like this. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> She's with Fitz now. She's with Fitz now, but but oh, oh. Trip. We had to lose him all over again. It was really not. It fair. was heartbreaking, no. but it was so good to see him. I like Trip, and I didn't like the way he died. So same. <laughs> yeah, we got a little more closure here. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah, not much. Is it closure when it's the framework and it was never really there? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works for you. So what about some of the other pieces of this? Madam Hydra. Oh, so fitting that she chose the name Ophelia. I don't know, just, you know, the tragic figure from Hamlet, from Shakespeare's Hamlet, and just, I don't know, of course she sees herself as the tragic figure. I've had to create all of this yeah. for you, and it's just so you love me, and yeah, of course. Then he she, doesn't. No, mm -hmm. it's like, of course she chooses the name Ophelia. Of course she does, because that's how she sees herself. And I thought that was a very, very smart writing moment. Yeah, Pinocchio, we're, you know, hoping to become a real boy, or in her case, a real girl. <laughs> and she did become a real she girl. Did. She did. Yeah, well, that was freaky. Die. Yeah, it was freaky. So part of what we learn is that, A, they are taking in humans and experimenting on them, not so much just mm -hmm. killing them outright. And they have this thing called Project Looking Glass, which I feel was referenced prior to this half season. I kept thinking, like, that seems really familiar to me, aside from the Alice mm -hmm. in Wonderland reference. Yeah. But I just couldn't place it. Maybe I'm just crazy. But Project Looking Glass is, again, with dark hole knowledge, making some sort of device that will 3D model print a body. <laughs> but, but make them human. Like, yes. it, when, you know, because Ada's in the framework, and she's working on Project Looking Glass... And then in the real world, they're working on the sister component of Project Looking Glass. 
So as soon as she essentially gets scanned in, in the framework by this machine, in the real world, it starts actually making her physically human. It cr literally creates her from the ground up. So she's no longer an android. She's flesh and blood and can mm -hmm. be killed. But is she really flesh and blood human? Or she's, is she just a really, 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 really advanced robot? No, she it looks to me I, to be mechanical. I think she's flesh and blood human or inhuman because she does have inhuman powers. That's how I understood it is that she actually became real. That was her whole goal is to become a real living <laughs> human so she could be with Fitz. I know. I guess I'm just drawing a distinction between what her body was. I mean, I think her brain and her emotions and her core were all biologically or, you know, lack of a better term, spiritually rooted in humanity. Because, again, this dark hole thing, what is it? <laughs> you know? Yeah. What, what kind of power does it bring? But when it, when it was printing or making the body and the, and the machine... It looked like all of the components, the, the skeleton, spine, you saw the spine and the hips and everything, they looked metal. So I just, that's why I was confused. Hmm. Like, is she human? She's more human than ever, of course. Yeah. But is she really human? That's the question I had. And then plus inhuman powers. All the experiments on the inhumans. Were to harvest like almost the best of the best. Because she had more than one power too. She was she did. multi powered in human. She had a nightcrawler power. She did. That was kind of cool. With a nightcrawler effect. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's nightcrawler. <laughs> and she also had either a Lincoln or a Jubilee. You can argue. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, where is all this coming from? You guys are really quiet. Yeah. I thought there would be way more talk about We're just all in agreement about how much we yeah. loved it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's no, like one of my favorite things yeah. about this season in particular was not just the casting, but how they used Ghost Rider. I thought the actor that played him did a great, great job, and I was actually really sad to see him have to leave when he got sucked back into the hell dimension, or he chose to go back to finish up some business. But then in the face of this multi-powered, nearly unstoppable Ada, we then had him come back and show with that badass chain that he... <laughs> Is though at least at least one thing that can hurt her, mm -hmm. not maybe not irreparably, but definitely not as superficially as you know things like bullets. Now, was it in this section where the Ghost Rider power temporarily transferred? I was, yeah, I was yes. just thinking yeah. about that. That so the this, second yeah, last didn't go into Coulson. Coulson. Yeah, so that was I think at the end of the yeah of the dark matter arc i can't remember the elliot i think was his uncle's name i think it was at the end of that arc that they did that it was are you talking about when colson picked up the ghost rider spirit of vengeance yes yeah did that happen in 4a because i don't recall that i don't i don't know it happened, happened here B, yeah yeah this last part because the uncle's already dead and gone yeah yeah robbie mm -hmm. became ghost rider in 4a he yeah. picked up yeah. the spirit of vengeance from somebody else who had the spirit of vengeance and rode a motorcycle. Yeah. And he waxed on okay, about how yeah, that's it went what I'm from thinking motorcycle of. to yeah. a car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was the end of this. That yeah. Because it was ends. only a temporary transfer yeah. to Coulson before Robbie yeah. picked it back up. Because Coulson <laughs> was the one who ultimately snuffed out Ada. Yeah. yeah. Using the spirit of vengeance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we don't know how or why that happened. They didn't show that. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. And Robbie makes a side reference. So just to kind of connect the dots for the listener, if you recall, you know, they they are able to get out of the framework. There's a back door that Radcliffe, for their first back door was discovered and disabled by Ada. There was a second back door on, a, coincidentally, an oil rig that Radcliffe did not tell Ada about. So they become, the, their whole purpose is to get out of the framework because otherwise Ada will kill them on the outside. And if you, yeah, if you, or it's, if you die in, in the framework, the you die in the real world and vice mm -hmm. versa. That's correct. There's a, a lot of stuff that we kind of are skipping over because Fitz and Simmons, I feel like we have to come back to that. We will. They get back to the real world and Robbie Reyes, a.k.a. Ghost Rider, comes through a portal because remember, he got sucked up by that quantum box. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. his uncle last season. Yeah. And then he came back through a portal, and he says, I'm here because the dark hole draws the demon here. Mm -hmm. And I need to get the dark hole, and I need to destroy the person who's using it, which is Ada, or slash Ophelia, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call her at this point. So he is able to hurt her, presumably because everybody's connected to the dark hole, including the spirit of vengeance, which is the ghost rider demon. 
But at some point, and for some reason, uh, and that was one of the things I wanted to speculate on with all of you about, especially also, are we going to see Ghost Rider again? Coulson temporarily has that spirit and is the one that takes out Ada. And then when it goes back to Robbie, however that happens, Robbie makes some allusion to the deal you made. What is that deal? Did you catch that? No, I go. I guess I don't remember that. That's. I just watched it. A was couple that the days very ago. very end? This was yeah. like right when the last goes, and last episode. Yeah, because yeah. this is where we thought Gemma Simmons had died, but it was one of yeah. her LMDs that yeah. they ended up killing. To this is all to fool Ada to eventually get her. Yeah, all it says was that. I'm, I'm looking it up because this was confusing for me, too. It, has, it just says that the Ghost Rider left and, retur- you know, it left Reyes and went into Coulson. And then as soon as the job was done, it says here in this article that I found that Robbie noted to Coulson that there was only one reason the Ghost Rider agreed to swap hosts. Coulson indicated that he understood, but would like the reason to remain secret until he was ready to reveal the truth to the rest of his team. So I think that's a mystery that they are going to hopefully address next season yeah, if they're kind yeah, of setting it up for how is it possible for Coulson to get this, the spirit of vengeance. I mean, the only thing I can think that that would mean is because since Robbie already had an object for vengeance when he found the spirit because yeah. his brother had already been mm-hmm. victimized by the gang members, that I feel like that must mean that there's some secret vendetta that maybe that Coulson's that Coulson been holding has. on to mm-hmm. for a while, right. which like opened up space for mm-hmm. the spirit to transfer into him that he's just been you know too busy or too right. cool-headed to really go off on. Right. Well, because they also talk about, too, how in the first half of season four, when Robbie was trapped in between dimensions, the Ghost Rider left him and attached himself to Mac temporarily as well. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's so right. there's, so I think, yeah, I think Mike is onto something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's I, what I was thinking. Of I before almost was the Mac transfer. I almost wonder if Coulson has vengeance because his lady love was wasn't she killed this season? That woman by agent. Was that? She was killed by Ward. Oh, should never mind. Uh, but that yeah, could that be was... that could be part of his vengeance is getting. Mm-hmm. Back for that, I don't it know, could or be. it could be something we it don't know be. about yet. Or maybe he was attacking Ada in vengeance for May because when yeah he he, he was cagey mm. about why May May kept asking him why'd you crack the bottle you know why you why you right why you, you did you it without me and... yeah why couldn't you tell that she was fake and I was real and he kept skirting mm-hmm. the issue like uh, you know it was real complex it was scary times so maybe the secret for now is that. The vengeance he was seeking was because May was the first one. I mean, he was hell bent to find her and was the first one to be kidnapped by Ada mm-hmm. and plugged into mm-hmm. the framework. So maybe yeah. that's why the vengeance demon, that's what I'm going to call it, the vengeance demon mm-hmm. latched itself on. I think that the reason why it latched itself on to Mac, though, if I recall, in the previous season was because Robbie was on the other side of the portal and kind of that void dimension. <laughs> yeah. I don't know science of superhero stuff. <laughs> but you know, I think that's the reason it needed to be on the other side of the portal. Mm-hmm. So and Mac was very mad about something at that point. I yeah. can't remember what it was, but there was part of that. So that didn't question leave a question and it was such a, you know, qu- quick mention when it happened this part when it happened that that's why I asked that question. Can we talk about Mac and Yo-Yo in their arc? No. Yes. Genesee, arc no, but I want to. At least for the last part of the framework was. Yeah, we got to talk about Fitz and Simmons. Too. Okay, fine. Let's do Fitz and Simmons first. No, you can talk yeah. about Mac and Yo-Yo No, first. I was just going to say, I, with with Mac's character, I was, he's hiding out from Hydra. He's not a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, and he's protecting his daughter. And, you know, Yo-Yo is outside of the framework. She's in the Quinjet flying around trying to keep everybody's safe and her thing for Daisy is bring him home bring him back and when I think Daisy pops out of the framework she kind of goes through the portal and she tells Yo-Yo he's not coming back he's staying to protect his daughter because she's alive in that reality and he wants to be in that reality with her and he leaves Yo-Yo in the real world Yo-Yo gets so upset and it's tragic and it's heartbreaking and then she ends up plugging herself into the framework in secret and tries to go and save Mac 
and has a very heartbreaking conversation with him and is trying to remind him of their relationship, I guess you could call it. I think it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is essentially what brought Mac back to the real world was... Well, that and the fact that Hope did ultimately disappear. She did disappear. Because mm-hmm. uh, as the framework was breaking down and being destroyed. But I liked that little bookend on their relationship. I felt, you know, if anything is going to get Mac back, it's going to be Yo-Yo. Mm-hmm. She's, you know, See, she's his anchor. I didn't feel like that because... I have the exact opposite feelings than you all have, but <laughs> wow. I thought that if Daisy got a hold of him, she would be able to bring him back and make, get him to remember. Just because and of she tried, the previous. she tried, and she it did, didn't work, tried. right? Which I was heartbroken. So you, I think you are just really shipping Daisy and Mac. No, I'm not actually. <laughs> I'm more for. I was more for Daisy and Ward than mm-hmm. than. Mac and him. I'm just, I thought the connection that Mac and Daisy had was not like a sexual attraction or anything like that. It was more like a brother sister kind of thing. Daisy and Mac. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I thought they had more of a connection like that, like a friendship, and that she was closer to Mac. She'd known Mac longer than Yo Yo, of course. I just thought she would be able to bring bring him back but she she couldn't but i think what they set up and i think they set it up very well is that mac has a lot of walls up yeah he's he's the Mm -hmm. protector for everybody else but that in itself is a is a wall because he's dealing with so much pain that's why i've never changed his description Mm -hmm. because he's always kind of working through pain that he is bottled up right Mm -hmm. and what we learn about in this half season is hope that's yeah. the very first mm-hmm. time he gives name mm-hmm. to this thing that he's been alluding to for like a couple mm-hmm. seasons now. Yeah. And he, what Daisy says, Daisy and Yo-Yo have a conversation, and Yo-Yo talks. Well, Daisy tells Yo-Yo when she comes out of the framework, he's got a daughter in there, Hope. And Yo-Yo says, Hope? Hope is his daughter. He's not supposed to be alive. And Daisy says, well, I never knew that. Mm-hmm. He never told me that, but he did tell Yo-Yo. Yeah, yeah. Yo-Yo is the mm-hmm. very first character that kind of has started to break down his walls, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's why that's why she becomes the character I think that can save him and can convince him. Daisy mm-hmm. hasn't been able to reach the kind of connection that you're talking about, right? Because he still keeps her at an arm's length, right? And part of that is Daisy's fault too. Yeah. I mean, she yeah. ran away for a exactly. while, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, know? yes. Mm-hmm. I guess because I had missed all of the flirtation between Yo-Yo and Mac that I didn't buy into the whole thing. If I had caught on to all of that, I guess I was just, I don't know, what was I doing when I was watching these episodes? I didn't, I didn't, I totally missed all of that. And so maybe if I hadn't, I'd probably, maybe I'd feel more like you guys if I had actually was seeing it develop, but. I mean, they're not my favorite couple, but I buy into them a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because they didn't try to ram that one as much. I don't know. I feel like maybe our, or maybe our focus has been entirely on Fitzsimmons. Yeah, I was just going to say that. We've been more focused on Daisy and Ward. Mm -hmm. Daisy and Lincoln. Yeah. 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 Colson and May, for crying out loud. (laughs) (laughs) Colson and May is kind of weird. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. Well, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. It is a little bit weird, but it, I don't mind it. It's logical. Yeah. yeah, it is it logical. It is logical. It is. Yeah. Another factor, I think, in that, like, let her be the one that got him out of there was, like, Daisy and Simmons were both in there, and they both talked to him and said, like, this isn't real. You have to come out. This isn't, like, it's all fake. What you're feeling is fake. You have to come to the real world. And then when it came time, like... They didn't force him to leave, but they also did leave him. Whereas Yo-Yo, even though she knew that the world was collapsing, she said, fine, then if this is where you're going to be, then I'm going to stay here Mm -hmm. with you. Which just, even if he didn't remember who she was, that's still a very big, I think, vote of confidence in her as to who she is as a person and how she feels about him. So then when Hope disappeared kind of joking, but hope, his hope also did disappear for that world. Yeah, I don't think yeah. she was so ironically I think he named. Probably <laughs> no, figured, uh, like, not at all. If she's not here, then there's no reason for me to be here, so sure, let's go try this world that you're talking about, because mm-hmm. you seem to care. Yes, maybe one day you'll rewatch it, and you'll go back and you'll see You'll oh, pick up on the clues. The maybe, but not likely. <laughs> 
Jen's being stubborn. <laughs> That's fine. I definitely like them better as a couple than Bobby and Hunter, which oh, yeah. I oh, like I, them individually. I don't together, miss Together, I was not mm-hmm. a fan. Yeah, I was not a fan of that. Yeah, don't miss them. I don't. Miss I liked their goodbye. That was it. Was very nice and heartfelt. Yeah, and yeah. kind of just solidified that, the that family. That was kind feel. of the high point of them on the show. I mean, in the end, it's kind of funny because they came, them and Mac, all came together, and I don't, I don't miss them, but no. I would miss him. I would too. Mm-hmm. If he disappeared. Yeah. I thought I liked Lance a lot better than I did, but I don't feel a vacuum. No. For, from their characters. I do feel a vacuum from Ward's character. I yeah. do. Because yeah. he was such an integral part of everything that was that part of started the story. It. Yeah. yeah. He was from, from the Plus, beginning. he's a charismatic guy. And he's, yeah. he's so good looking. He is very yeah, good looking. Yeah, he is good looking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're just going to put them all on the table now. Yeah. <laughs> And one of the best points of writing for me in this series as a whole was the final moment with Lincoln and Ward slash Hive in, in that ship because although I'd reviled him the entire season in that moment, like I had nothing against Hive and I could you could just like see the pure, actually good motives that he had. And I think they kind of duplicated that success a little bit in this one with Mace and his death because yeah. although he didn't know in his real mind that he was a real hero in the framework. I, th- I think he got to, first of all, he was essentially Captain America in the Agents of Hydra world. He but was, also yeah. just the way that he died was, I think, what the real him would, would like envied in humans for and superheroes for and really, really wanted deep down. Yeah, was to he be died able to do something hero. like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree with that completely. I, I felt very satisfied by the character arc based on that ending. Me too. Mm-hmm. The only other thing I really want to hit on before we get to the cliffhanger is, so Ghost Rider, let's talk about Ghost Rider a little bit more, just because I feel like, I don't know, he comes in and he goes again. He served a purpose and he goes again. How did we feel about their use of Ghost Rider now, looking over the whole season? And also, do you want him to come back? And would there be a reason for him to? I think they used him efficiently, like... He's obviously, since he's more than, like, Ghost Rider is more on the magical side of Marvel. I think they brought him in for appropriate problems where they, they could have him on all the time and he would be useful, but I think it would kind of get a little dry. As far, but I think it's better that he has his own kind of itinerary of certain crimes that he has to go about solving. But I also don't think that they brought him back in a deus ex kind of way. Like, when he came back, I felt it was appropriate and not like a last minute, how do we get out of this writing mm-hmm. situation that we made. I felt like they, it was, it was just, the, all of his appearances, I think, were justified. Yeah, I think looking back and also from this point going forward, I like that he was brought in to transfer the power to Coulson to kill off Ada. Because I think mm-hmm. if Robbie, as Ghost Rider, would have done it himself then that would almost set him up to be, you know, the last minute, here I come to save the day kind of guy. And I really don't want him to get into that character Mm -hmm. stereotype. You know, I hope he does continue to pop up when it's actually necessary. I hope they don't do it Mm -hmm. just to just for the sake of bringing him back. I don't like it when writers do it just for the sake of things. I like it when they do more with a purpose. So I, I hope we see him again, but I hope, again, it's just not the pattern of, oh, they're in a pinch. We've run into a corner. Oh, let's get Ghost Rider. I hope that doesn't happen. I agree with that. I just don't want... I think he should only pop up a couple of times, whatever, a few times, you know, every now and then. I think if you have him come on more and more, and he's more like a regular, it just seems like it's a, a too easy of a scapegoat to fix a problem, mm-hmm. a writing, whether it's a writing problem or, you know, whatever. I like his chemistry with but Daisy. I do, I do too. too. I and do I too. really cracked up with the line that Colson says about, oh, you two were working together and I missed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they they make a really good team. So that's another mm-hmm. reason I hope that he continues to show up. Or yeah, you know maybe they'll have maybe he'll be the next love interest for Daisy. We don't know. Yeah, fingers crossed. Okay. I mean they they I think did it'd be form a, good... a little rapport over they the did. first half of the season. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. I mean I agree. I don't want him to be there all the time. I I don't think that that's appropriate, and I don't think it's in keeping with the Ghost Rider character mm-hmm. as much as I know of it, which isn't very much. But at the same time, I just, I agree with you, Micah. I don't think they did it in a, in a deus ex machina kind of way where it's like, oh, by the way, here he is. I think it was a nice bookend and it actually served the first half of the season better 
than how they ended his departure on the first half of the season. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I also feel like, like I said in the previous episode where we were talking about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., that's such a rich character that hasn't been given a good live-action treatment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of possibility there that maybe if not on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., they could find a way to sort of give him his own vehicle. It's a good actor. We finally get good effects. Mm -hmm. It's not Nicolas mm -hmm. Cage. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> and then he can come in crossover from time to time. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so give him it like a yeah. spinoff. Give him a spinoff. I would, I would watch that. I think actually. it would do best on Netflix, but mm -hmm. yeah. I'd yeah, there'd be something yeah. on Netflix yeah. to do. Yeah. Probably. Ghost Rider, I think, was an original comic member of the Defenders, which, as we probably know, Netflix is coming out with later this, I think it's later this year, which I'm excited about. This month. Yeah, one week, the Defenders yeah. is coming One week from oh. this recording <laughs> date. Well, so technically, yes, later this year. <laughs> <laughs> one parallel that I kind of drew with him, though, which I kind of, I wouldn't want him to have a Ghost Rider show, maybe, maybe on Netflix I think it would work, but not on, on regular network like ABC, is because I'm thinking of John Constantine, who is a DC uh, character yeah, who yeah. deals with the supernatural, and his show, which they only had one season of, did not do very well at all. Mm -hmm. But when they brought him on as a crossover for a couple episodes of Arrow, I think those episodes were extremely high rated. So I think that sometimes there's a little more power in having a character only show up every now and then because, I mean, it gives you time to miss them, so then when they come back, you're even more excited. To be fair, though, the Constantine, I did watch the Constantine one season, and they didn't, the writers kind of screwed their own show over, mm. personally, because I think he was great, and if they oh, had yeah. set it up better, it would have done better, but I also agree that his couple of appearances on Arrow were extremely good. I don't know if that logic flies in that example, only because I think NBC interfered too much with that. Mm since they're the ones who had that show. Now we get another epilogue on the end of the season, a cliffhanger. They all have, they, they're all, oh, we didn't talk about Fitzsimmons yeah. yet. Let's, oh, yeah, yeah let's back about, up. We have to talk about <laughs> Fitzsimmons, <laughs> because this was a big deal. I mean, Jen already talked mm -hmm. about the fact that Fitz and his framework persona mm -hmm. did not know Simmons, mm -hmm. and he was evil because he was, he was close to his dad, who yeah. was evil. <laughs> and he's the one who actually pulled the trigger to kill Agnes, mm -hmm. the he real did. life. Ada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In front of Simmons and Which Warren. Which broke my heart. Warren. He killed somebody. Yes. Yeah, in, in, literally in cold uh, blood. Just yes, did it. Yes, he did. I was like, Ugh. And Ward was all ready to take the shot, take out mm -hmm. the doctor, and Simmons stood up and was like, no, no I love okay. him. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do that. And so he doesn't. And she catches, you know, heck for that for a while. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think the biggest game changer is she goes to confront Fitz Daddy, whose mm -hmm. name is Alistair, yep. yeah. basically to say, you know, look, this isn't real, your your son is horrible, he's with Madame Hydra, she's horrible, I love him, I want what's best for him, trying to make that case, and he's not buying any of it, and mm -hmm. he goes to kill her, in the meantime, Fitz is over the phone, you know, yes, with home. his dad, yeah, yeah hearing everything. Hearing Alistair yeah. calls him and says, you know, there's this chick here trying to tell me that she loves you and everything. He goes to strangle Simmons, and Simmons, ultimately in self-defense. I mean, she says accidentally, but it's, it's self-defense. Self <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. It's a purposeful choice, but for a good reason. Takes out Alistair, shoots him. While Fitz is listening on the telephone, mm -hmm. evil Fitz now, Dr. Fitz, mm -hmm. and then he resolves with Radcliffe's help, by the way. He sort of, we think, talks Radcliffe into kind of giving over the canary from his cell where he's being tortured after he shoots Agnes to help him hunt Simmons down. And there is actually a confrontation between Fitz and Simmons where Fitz even shoots her in the leg right, yes. <laughs> yep, yes. before he's getting ready to shoot her more mm -hmm. family. What about all that? Plus all the robots. <laughs> what are you stuff? doing, Fitz? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, what I are think you this doing? is another Whedon thing. They uh, always have to make our happy relationships unhappy. Yeah. And now they're morally complicated. Fitz is struggling with his post framework through, identity. Through this whole <laughs> thing, I was literally cursing my computer screen. I just, it was a love hate thing with mm -hmm. Fitz. I love Fitz, but I hate what he's doing right now. I know it's not him, it's, you know, all that in the framework, but 
It was good though. Mm-hmm. It, I really enjoyed that section of the of the of the season. See, you recognize that it wasn't him. I wish that he would have been able to do that because. I was fine with all the in framework stuff between them that was all very high stakes and very dramatic. But after they got out, and I know it wasn't that many episodes when they were out out for the final confrontation with Ada, but it just seemed like he was way too hung up on the imaginary crimes that he had done. Like I get that he had chose to do them whether or not he knew it was real or not, but I don't know. It just there you know, when the character harps on something too long, you're just like, Can you just can you just be like get over it a little bit? I was a little done with him at the end, and definitely, I think in the past he's been kind of a driving force with the plotline for Fitzsimmons. But this was definitely Gemma's season half, mm-hmm. definitely hers. Yeah, I really like the opportunity that they gave Elizabeth Henstridge, who plays Simmons. I like the opportunities that they gave her to really show what she can do. Mm-hmm. I mean, her character got shot in the leg, and she's still there fighting and pleading for her love to wake up essentially and Mm -hmm. just the heartbreak on her face and then her playing the lmd version of herself who gets killed you know she was given a lot of opportunities this year just like most of the other actors were which i felt very rewarded watching it so hopefully she felt rewarded doing it but i felt all this is adding to the strength of the fitzsimmons relationship they are literally going through hell and back to be with each other multiple times. Fitz has had brain damage. Gemma's been on the, the other planet. And now, you know, this whole framework thing where they didn't know each other and Fitz is totally evil. And, you know, finally when they force him to come back to the real world, I mean, they physically, I think they shoot him at some point, don't they, to subdue him a little bit? Do they shoot him or do they just grab him by both arms and they hurl, grab him, they grab him and hurl him into the back door? Shot. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, but he... Oh, no. Radcliffe pushes him. Yeah. Yeah. Radcliffe basically, because what happens is Radcliffe and Fitz find Gemma together because Fitz tries to convince Radcliffe, hey, you know, work with me. I have a mm-hmm. way to make you immortal, which is basically looking glass. Yeah. And Radcliffe plays like, okay, yeah, I'm on board for this. But I think we learn that Radcliffe is really playing Dr. Mm-hmm. Fitz all along because when Fitz is ready to shoot Simmons, Radcliffe basically does like either hit him yeah he does something to subdue him and then ends up dragging him and then pushing Pushing him him over Mm -hmm. into the back door to get him back to the real world and it's it's once Fitz wakes up and he has all the memories of everything that happened in the framework his whole it's almost like he has the whole second life his relationship with his dad and never knowing Simmons and his relationship with Ada slash Ophelia slash Madam Hydra. And he has such a hard time reconciling that while the others like May and Coulson, they are just like, oh yeah, that happened, but that wasn't me. We're just going to move on and, you know, forgive and forget and go. Like Micah said, Fitz has a really hard time of reconciling it or letting it go. And now he's not himself. He has to work through the fact that he shot Gemma, who he loves with, you know, his whole heart. And he killed somebody that, you know, he's never killed anybody before. He's not that kind of guy. And I think this will just be another test of Fitz needs to learn to forgive himself and Gemma needs to, unfortunately, wait for him now at this point. Yeah, that reminds me of something. I know, Micah, you said that Fitz kind of got, I'm going to use the word tedious, that's not the word you used, <laughs> post-framework, <laughs> yeah. because, you know, he couldn't just reconcile. But I bought that with his character. It, it, first, For me, first of all, it wasn't as tedious as Daisy the first half of the season. Yes. And her post six month mm-hmm. time jump, yeah. lamenting Lincoln and determined to be the martyr of the whole equation by going rogue no. in yeah. the quakeness. I thought that was way more tedious. Yes. I mm-hmm. bought the Fitz piece. First of all, it only lasted an episode or two. Second of all, his character, which is always prone to wanting to do right by Gemma particularly, but everybody else, plus the fact that everybody struggled with framework post-emerging from it mm-hmm. because the memories they had were still real to them. It was a whole palpable. second life. It was a whole yeah. second life crammed into their brains, and his brain, his life was so different. Mm-hmm. And he's such a good-hearted person. And he's good heart that I think it was almost like a feedback loop. So I bought that for a while. And I think he snapped out of it when Ada went all jealous rage on him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. Because he, he basically was like, no, no, she's breaking out. She's going crazy. You can't stop her. I mean, he, he lost yeah. kind of that that feedback loop until the very, very end. And Daisy gave him 
kind of her heroic monologue speech yeah. in the very last finale episode to say, you know, Fitz, we know you feel bad, but we're all this way, and we're all a family, and we're going to get through it, and then you seem to be okay. So I was okay with that. But I thought that the Fitz and Simmons dynamic throughout this entire half season from the LMDPs mm-hmm. when they were confronting each other and he was really a robot <laughs> yeah. to this half of the season where he was evil and she was supposed to be dead but wasn't. I mean, there was just so much, I felt so mm-hmm. much more dramatic tension around the two of them. And not in a good way. I mean, I wanted them to come out of it and, and still be Fitzsimmons because I was afraid we were facing a Joss Whedon, I'm determined to make my happy couples unhappy thing like I'm Buffy and Angel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately that didn't happen I think they're still going to have some stuff to work through but I thought it was a very touching scene when Fitz was kind of sitting all crumpled you know in wherever in the shield mm-hmm. headquarters and Gemma just sits by him and takes him into her arms and he starts crying I thought yeah. that was a very powerful scene and mm-hmm. cathartic too one thing that all the framework stuff even though there was a lot of heart wrenching moments because of it that I think will help the characters moving on, specifically Fitz and Mac, is relationships that they didn't get to have in the mm-hmm. real in their real lives. Even though they were artificial, they still have those memories there. And even if you know the memories are fake, that still doesn't mean that it's like worthless. So now Fitz, if real. he wants to remember like good things about his dad, he has memories of mm-hmm. that. And Mac has ten years of memories of his daughter Hope rather than just two days. And he actually has like a face and he can remember like teaching her things. And I think that will definitely help him. Heal, like, maybe. Yeah. Help those characters to open up to their significant others in the real world as well. And also just make them, I think stronger people. I think it'll help break Max walls down a little bit. And I mm-hmm. think for Fitz, it will get him to see that there are no absolutes. He can't always be right. He can't always be wrong. I think that's mm-hmm. one of the things that Fitz struggles with the most. Just because he knows his dad is a bad seed, he's so afraid mm-hmm. of being yeah. like his dad yeah. that he doesn't want to like upset the apple cart, as it were. And I think he had a taste of being like um, his dad, like his dad, and maybe came to an understanding that he didn't previously have. I mean, his dad clearly loved him in the framework. Now, maybe we'll meet his dad. I, I don't know if we've met him already. <laughs> I feel like we did. Eclipse, maybe. Maybe, because he looked, the actor looked very familiar. He's been in other things. Mm-hmm. He, I know, he, but it just, I feel like I, we've seen him maybe in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. once or, I don't know. You know, maybe he was like in a, a photo or something. Or something. Yeah, I feel, I think. But the actor was perfectly cast. Yeah. He and, yeah. he, he and Fitz, they look a lot mm-hmm. alike, which was oddly appropriate. I kind of think that, you know, Scotland is thinking represent because they have three Scottish actors both in one (laughs) half season. Just saying. (laughs) So, okay, I'm glad we talked about Fitzsimmons. I would have felt regretful if we hadn't. So we get to an epilogue. Again, just like we did last season. And this epilogue, you know, after they get out of the framework and they agree we're going to we're going to be a family. Part of what has happened in the meantime is that Talbot, as a result of not only Nadir's death, but also the fact that they found Mace's body blown to bits at sea, <laughs> which happened because Ivanov attacked the platform where they were. And that's because Yo-Yo decloaked the Quinjet because it was losing power, power. to the framework. And it was a whole <laughs> massive like domino of events. We got to see those three C rank shield agents that we'd seen in episodes before. Yeah, yeah they came the back and had well. some lines. Oh, good. They still exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so everybody comes together. They're like, they're fugitives. They're, they've been declared enemies of the state. Shield is, again, you know, evil, <laughs> according to Talbot and everybody else who would have them believe it. They're hunting for them, especially Daisy, because, you know, inhuman, won't sign the Sokovia Accords. That was a whole big piece. So they decide to go have breakfast in a diner. Some people, shadowy figures show up, may or may not be government, and then the next thing we know, Coulson wakes up, either on some sort of space station or a spaceship. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, because yeah. didn't they have, like, some technology where they freezed everybody? They did and then- freeze everyone. And then took, we assume, just Coulson, but we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. We don't know where anybody else is. Yeah. 
So here are the questions I'd like you to predict or speculate upon. Who took these shield people? And by who I mean, who do you think they really are? <laughs> where is Coulson, do you think? And where did the rest of them go? Where is Coulson? And how did he get there? And how did he get there? <laughs> They're going to have to explain, like... Well, I'm there's really... there are spaceships and portals and things. I, I there's that. many I that, of, but... many possibilities there. I'm less concerned about the how as the why and where. I think the government took Coulson, and I think that once again they're playing with the media and pretending that Shield is evil, just so they can use Coulson and maybe other agents as well on this covert secret mission in space. To do what? I don't know yet. I say um, Hydra is behind it all. Okay. And Aphelia is not really dead. <laughs> you shook your head. So I, are you being a joke? I'm being dramatic. I'm I, asking I, you to make a prediction, <laughs> Jen. <laughs> this is a I podcast. Mean, no, I do think Hydra is behind it. As a, you know, she says government. I guess I'm, I'm saying Hydra. You're yeah. being more specific. Yeah. Clarifying question. Sure. Did we see a specific cause of the freezing? Like, did we see a specific device used? We saw something, but it was so obscured by shadow. Like, I don't yeah. think it could be mm-hmm. identified. There was green oh, okay. light involved. But there was green light, yeah. There but was... it did seem to be an object of some kind, not there a person. There was an yeah. object, yes. And you, you okay. Know, well, it makes sense, because usually, this is kind of pulling a little further, but Disney always uses, like, lime green to signify evil. So I don't know, maybe mm-hmm. it is. It could be, yeah. It could be, because Hydra was also signified with evil yeah. with yeah. the opening credits this little quarter yeah. season. So that would make sense. One of the things I was thinking of, because we also have, I don't know what the future of this show is going to be because they've put the impending Inhumans series as well. It's been, it's been cast. I think there was a trailer out for it's it as well. So if it wasn't a device, I was going to say it could be possible that, because at one point in the comics, the Inhuman royal family, they're, they're based in space, like orbiting the Earth. So I thought it might have been them. But if it's a device, I think that, I mean... There are numerous organizations in the comics they could draw from. There's Raid, there's AIM, but also there is a, it's kind of a counterpart to S.H.I.E.L.D. It's essentially the men in black version of S.H.I.E.L.D. for the Marvel Universe called S.W.O.R.D. And they deal with all of the alien off-world stuff. Like they have units that are out in space and stuff like that. So that's another possibility as well. Oh, that's insight. Mm -hmm. I was also going to put a vote in for Hydra. Just because we have been saying Hydra can't be dead, you cut off heads, other heads grow. Mm-hmm. Isn't that their whole slogan? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the fact yeah. that we watched a fake Hydra emerge in the framework for such a long time. Now maybe that was a red herring, but I feel like between them mentioning, like making honest to God goodness mention of the fact that there are ex Hydra agents in the Watchdogs, mm-hmm. coupled with all the things mm-hmm. that have happened around Shield coupled with the fact that we have this framework, which i got to feel more than just Radcliffe knows about. And if Ivanov was in bed with any of the Hydra, maybe there are Hydra heads in secret that just haven't emerged. It's very possible that Hydra's coming back. But I would be intrigued to learn if it was one of these other Marvel pockets. They have been introducing more and more, especially on S.H.I.E.L.D. But they are going to have, they are the Marvel's Inhumans show has been picked up and will go to broadcast and on ABC because Agents mm. of S.H.I.E.L.D. is not going to be premiering until mid-season this time because, for whatever the reason, they're holding that one back. Or maybe they're delaying the premiere date significantly, but it hasn't been announced. So I'm wondering if they're planning for crossover. But I was wondering, when I read the plot synopsis of Inhumans, it seems to me like that's more of an origin story of the royal mm. family. So I don't know, maybe we're also getting a little bit more glimpse into, you know, we keep asking about the Kree and the planet. That's right. Maybe they're finally coming back around to that because we spent so much time Mm -hmm. on this planet where there just happened to be something that looks like the symbol of Hydra. And since they Mm -hmm. all interconnect, maybe they're bringing that back around. That would be my main question if the, the group who abducted the S.H.I.E.L.D. team was a new, like, branch of hydra because despite what the implications were in the first captain america movie in the show we they expressly like claimed that the entire point of hydra like its entire ultimate goal was the retrieval and like exultance of hive 
but now that that's done, if it is another Hydra group that's taken the S.H.I.E.L.D. people, I'm, I'd be very curious to see what kind of the goals they have and what kind of organization they are. I have a quick update, because I just looked it up. They did actually release the season, sorry, the series premiere date of Inhumans. It is premiering Friday, September 29th. So S.H.I.E.L.D. will pick up at mid-season, Inhumans will start off in the fall. Yeah, mm. so I'm wondering mm. if maybe we're getting a seed oh, or yeah. prequel. Mm-hmm. I know that Ramsay Bolton is one of the royal family <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. for you Game of Thrones people, <laughs> which is not Jen. Get with them now. I don't have HBO. I think you can get it now. <laughs> 30 days free. Yes. I can pay $10 a month and get it with Amazon, apparently. You Amazon can. Prime. And Hulu has a pricing option for that as well. But that is something different. <laughs> yeah, something very, something very different. Thankfully, ABC's the app that you can get to stream stuff is generally free with more recent episodes. Mm-hmm. So. It is. It is. Plug for ABC. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to say or speculate on going into season five, or how do you, how do you feel about now going into season five? Let's ask this question, because season 4A, I got to tell you, Micah, it's probably good you weren't here, because all three of us were all, we're always very agreeable on this panel, number one. There's very little discord, I must say. And secondly, mm-hmm. we were all like, ugh, this is sad, we don't know how we feel about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., we might never watch it again, oh no, mm-hmm. and of course we did. So how do we feel about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. now going into season five? The main thing, because then it seems like they're branching into uncharted territory with this Maybe time skip, definitely space skip. So I'm pretty much just going to roll in with, I don't even know how to form questions. I'm just going to roll into the premiere of that one with an open mind and see what they serve up. But I just, for me, like bringing things over from this season, if they don't readdress the, or even touch on the Nadir, I forget what her brother's first name was, but his, his, yeah, inhuman abilities and secondary terror genesis, if they don't touch on that, that'll be something that I will be disappointed in them for leaving out. That's definitely a, a string that I would like tied up at some point. I just hope that they keep up their pacing and their writing that they introduced to us in the second half of season four. I think it really served mm-hmm. them well. And if they were to go back to the pacing issues that they've had previously, I think mm-hmm. the show will suffer from its increased viewership. It will suffer. It'll, it'll, sorry. It will suffer. And the increased viewership that they have gained will deplete. I'm interested to see how the effect of the dark hole, uh, the framework and everything had on everybody fits. His relationship with Simmons, I think, is going to be more of a struggle. Like, how is that? And, and May and Coulson, their relationship isn't going to make them closer and be a couple or whatever, you know. It'll be interesting how that all, the effects of it is. And if there is, if they do a time jump or a space jump, whatever, I they just need to... Make sure they explain themselves clearly, because mm-hmm. in past, not even just this show, but other shows that I've watched where there's been a jump, and they don't ever explain how this came to be. You're like, what's going on? This doesn't make sense, because there's no explanation. And so I just hope... Hashtag that falling skies. Yes. No. Yes. So oh, no. I just <laughs> hope that they don't do that, don't fall into that, whatever. I'm just excited to see where it goes. I think it's really got a good trajectory right now. I'm intrigued by this space angle, and I'm hoping that they come back to some of the dropped things. Not only, apparently, the secondary pterogenesis that Mike is referring to, but also maybe they will revisit some of the other questions that I've had all along. I do think that everybody's relationships will be tested especially since I get the sense that they might be separated. But we'll see what happens. You know, I'm, I'm excited to keep watching. Are you mm-hmm. all going to keep watching? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And then, of course, I have to ask at this juncture, would you, how do you feel about recommending the show nowadays to other people? At this point, they would have to go back and start from the beginning. And, again, it's you just kind of got to push through. Season two, I think, is what it was. Season that, one. Was it season one that was weird? Mm-hmm. I don't, that was slow. Yeah. Because season two was when Daisy was finding herself as an inhuman. Okay, yeah. yeah. So season there's that weird part in season one. You just got to push through it. But I think if you can work through it and you can wait, I think season the second half of season four is totally worth it. As is season three. I thought the high bar mm-hmm. was great. Season three was good, mm-hmm. too. So, yes, I'd recommend it. Start from the beginning. Yeah. 
I agree with that. Yeah, it's a, that first half of the season. Well, I mean, I I think this is a I think it's a hard show for someone to like if they're not already into comic books or superheroes or so. It's like I feel like it'd be a weird place to jump on to the Marvel bandwagon just starting with the show. But one advantage that this one does have is the interconnectivity with the Marvel movies is that you can say, okay, watch this first half of the first season, and then watch Captain America, The Winter mm-hmm. Soldier, and then watch, mm-hmm. then you can continue on with that. So I feel like that's a little more engaging of a format or an option for people that want to start the show rather than just keep watching, just watch season after season. Like there's, I don't know, there's there's some crossover. And like we do get the occasional cameo from Colby Smulder as Maria Hill or Samuel Jackson as Nick Fury. Or Lady Sif. Oh, yes, yeah. she okay. did good. I mean, I should ask you, Micah, since you're making crossover reference, you would say, would you say that people can watch it without having watched the films? Absolutely, because I think they do, like, w- whenever there is a movie break, I think the show does a good job of sliding in the information about, oh, yes, Hy- S.H.I.E.L.D. is now Hydra, which we learn in the Winter Soldier, or... Or like, oh, the Sokovia Accords are now a thing. I don't think they stay too vague with it or make it too relevant that the person's going to miss out on something. Yeah. I think the shows can stand alone, but, you know, it's just a little it's just a little extra if you wanted to spice up your watching experience. You can yeah. throw in the MCU movies as well. I agree. I hadn't watched Captain America the Winter Soldier when it was revealed in the show that S.H.I.E.L.D. was actually Hydra. And... While it did spoil Captain America for me <laughs> with that reveal, it I was still able to follow along with the show just fine, not having had watched the movie yet. I agree. I, I think they can exist independently, but that's all part of the Marvel perk, right? They're mm-hmm. richer together. Mm-hmm. Everything is builds upon it, each other and, and kind of makes the world more connected and more complete if you look at it as a universe as opposed mm-hmm. to... This is one section, and this is one section, and this is one section. And the Avengers. <laughs> and the Defenders. <laughs> yeah, I'm still waiting for some crossover between the ABC shows and the Netflix series. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. What's the third Avengers saga called? Can I say saga because it's two films? That's when you're going to get The Infinity all War. <laughs> Infinity War, but it, now it's only one movie. The fourth oh. Avengers movie is going to be something different. Oh. Mm. I didn't know about that. Yep, I they they decided it didn't need to be two movies. That's probably good. So. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I don't want to bloat it, I guess. They're going to have everybody in it, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anything else you want to say about Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 4B or what you hope to see in Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 5? R.I.P. trip. R.I.P. Hopefully the new Friday night time slot doesn't kill it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, they're moving. That's should. That's a good point, Kristen. Thank yeah. you for mentioning. They are moving this to Friday, along with Once Upon a Time, because some network runner thinks that they go well together. And oh, that the they, fans have yeah. been requesting it. The fans have not been requesting. No it. one's requesting that. <laughs> See, now I just feel like this showrunner is personally attacking the shows that I podcast for. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right yeah. <away. laughs> that's got to be it, Michael. We're going to go with that. so with that said i think we've concluded right yeah so since we've concluded i have to read the conclusion statement which goes like this cpu is produced by back pocket productions run by yours truly the cheap cotton potato and hails from grand rapids michigan please please do if you like what you hear take the time to rate us on itunes stitcher radio or google play give us a comment give us a star rating tell us how we're doing Tell others how we're doing because we think we've got something fun going on here. And if you think it's fun, you should tell other people because they're going to think it's fun too. If you have suggestions on shows you might consider, contact us at our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, via email at couchpotatoesunitepodcast at gmail.com, or via our social media, Facebook and Twitter. Though we are adding new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time. It's a big list now. As always, we have several more new episodes coming down the pike. We're available and searchable via the web. Find our old ones, find our new ones. Make sure you subscribe to the blog, any one of our channels, our social media, and stay up on new events and episodes, including our live events, which are coming down the pike. Until the next time, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. can be streamed in its entirety on, guess what, Netflix... And our Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. panel will reconvene. Now, because Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. does not start until mid-season, we will probably not reconvene for a whole other year 
to talk about mm. all of season five because that's how it works around here. We do the half seasons. So, you know, it's sad. But we'll come back. <laughs> so until next time, keep listening, keep watching, stay tuned. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kristen. I got you.